The year is 1787, just a few short months after delegates met in sweltering Philadelphia to draft the Constitution. Now, whether the rest of the country will ratify this Constitution at this point is anything but certain. Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, and John Jay, writing under the name Publius, begin writing a series of essays for the newspaper supporting this new constitution. And today these essays are known as the Federalist Papers and are still read and studied. These three men were incredibly influential in the eventual ratification of the constitution. That you enjoy the government that you do today owes quite a bit to them. The events that we've been talking about occurred a little over 200 years ago relatively recent history compared to the events we've been talking about the past few days. The three founders, going by Publius, had a purpose in writing the Federalist Papers. There were people who didn't think the United States should ratify the Constitution. The Federalist Papers were written to counter these arguments. Historians can easily determine what these arguments were. They have thousands of newspapers, thousands of personal letters, thousands of pamphlets from the same time that they can read and know what was going on at this time and what arguments were being put against the Constitution that the Federalist Papers were written to answer. There's even a book called The Anti-Federalist Papers that collects many of these together so we can see those arguments for ourselves. This isn't nearly as easy to do for documents that are thousands of years old like the books of the Old Testament. Sometimes all we have is the document itself. The documents that influenced, formed, and opposed it have long been lost. For historians trying to reconstruct the events and situations that led to that document's composition, it's like listening to just one side of the phone call. Historians are often less guessing the purpose of the document. The god of the previous showdown, Dagon, is mentioned only three times in the Bible. The God of today's show down, Bell, is mentioned numerous times throughout the Bible. And maybe that's a hint to the purpose of the biblical writers. Dagon never really tempted the Israelites. They never were tempted to worship him. So there wasn't a lot of reasons for the biblical writers to write arguments against Dagon. But on the other hand, the Israelites were tempted to worship Bell, and there's many times in the Bible where it's reported that they did turn from God and worship Bell. So the biblical writers had a lot more purpose the right countering bell so that the Israelites would turn back to God. The discovery of Ugarin in 1929 that I mentioned yesterday gave historians a sample of the other side of the phone call. A lot of the information that we had about Bell and Dagon before that time came just from the Bible. We only had one side of the phone call. What were discovered in um, Ugarit were tablets that told a sequence of stories about Bell called the Bell Cycle. And um, these three stories create um, all together the Bell Cycle. And I've got the names on the handouts of those three stories. It's uh, Bell and Yam, the Palace of Bell, Bell and Moth, as you see there in your handout. And in that very first story, uh, a god named Yam asked the other gods to make Bell surrender to him. Bell does not take kindly to this. He kills Yam with two clubs and declares himself king of the gods. And then we move on to the second story. And a king should have a palace, but Bell didn't have a palace. And the second story is about him getting one. <coughs> and Nat was Bell's sister, and she goes to their father, El, and she asks for a palace for Bell. Now, you probably don't like it when your sister sticks up for you. Well, how could you imagine if you were a god? Not only a god, but the king of the gods, and your sister's still sticking up for you. She's the one that goes to dad and says, hey, Bell's going to be king, he needs a palace. Well, El says no. So she does what all children does. She goes to her mother, and the name of the goddess that was her mother is Atherat. Atherat helps her convince Bell, and Bell agrees, okay, we'll give Bell his own temple since he's king of the gods now. And um, there's a long discussion in the story then about whether this palace should have a window or not. They finally decided that it should have a window. You probably didn't know that gods watched HGTV and fretted about interior decorating too. 
The final story is God versus God in the underworld. Mott challenges Bell, and Bell goes down to the underworld because Mott was an underworld god to fight Mott. And actually, Mott ends up killing Bell. He's dead. And um, Anath, his sister, is very um, upset about this. She buries him, and then she goes back and she kills Mott. And you'll remember uh, when we talked about the golden calf, I read a snippet of a story from the ancient Near East. It was actually from one of these tablets that was found in Ugrit that formed the Bell cycle, which forms most of what we know about Bell. And it was this portion, we were comparing it to how Moses destroyed the golden calf, similar to what happens in that story. And I've got that piece of the story here again. It says, As the heart of a cow to a calf, as the heart of a ewe to a lamb, so the heart of a gnat went out to Bell. She seized divine Mott. With a knife she split him. With a fan she winnowed him. With a fire she burnt him. With a sieve she sifted him. On the steps she abandoned him. In the sea she sowed him. So that's actually a piece from that third part of the story, the third episode of the story. With Bel dead, the gods needed another king. So they picked a god named Aftar. But when Aftar sat down in Bel's throne, his feet couldn't fit the footstool. So they decided that's not going to work. He can't be our king. We're going to send him to be ruler of the earth. I guess that was a demotion somehow. <laughs> but he had to become ruler of the earth. Well, shortly after this, somehow, Bell comes back to life. We're missing parts, you know, there's um, parts of the tablets that are broken, and this is really our only copy of the story, so we may be missing things, but somehow Bell comes back to life, and he takes the throne back, and he's king of the gods again. And shortly after this, Mott comes back to life too. And you guessed it, they started fighting again. But this time Mott decides they're both too strong, they're just going to fight forever, nobody's going to win. So he decides to hug it out, call it a truce, and we just won't fight anymore, and I'll let Bell stay king of the gods. <laughs> That's the information that we have about Bell outside the Bible. Now, um, unlike Dagon, we have a lot more information inside the Bible about Bell as well. And I've listed there in your handout just some of the verses. There's actually a lot more than that um, with Bell in it. I'm not going to go over all of those today, so if you had some time outside class that you want to study more on this topic, if that's something you're interested in, you can look up those verses yourself. I'm just going to look at one in particular, which is the one in Judges 6. And this is about Bel and a person named Gideon. You probably know Gideon from another story, and so this is the same Gideon. This is actually comes before that um, story. God is getting Gideon ready for that, but he's got to clear the idols out first before Gideon's going to be able to be a warrior for God. So God is talking to Gideon. And in Judges 6, 25, this is what God says to him. The Lord said to him, Take the second bull from your father's herd, the one seven years old. Tear down your father's altar to Bel, and cut down Asherah, the Asherah pole beside it. Then build a proper kind of altar to the Lord your God on top of this one. Using the wood of the Asherah pole that you cut down, offer the second bull as a burnt offering. So what um, Gideon did is he got ten buddies to sneak there in the middle of the night. And the story you know of Gideon probably is that he gets this big army and God keeps telling him, it needs to be smaller, it needs to be smaller. So even now we see Gideon doesn't like to do anything by himself. He's going to do something, he's going to get ten buddies that go do it with him. God told me to destroy this idol of my father's. Hey, you guys want to come help me do it? And also it says he does it at night. He was too chicken to do it in a day. And, and really that's what it says. We'll read on, you know, um, it doesn't use the word chicken, but uh, in verse 27. So Gideon took ten of his servants and did as the Lord told him. But because he was afraid of his family and the townspeople, he did it at night. Now, he was chicken, so he, he went, and God told him to destroy this idol, but he was going at night to do it. Now, God is not saying that vandalism is okay here. <laughs> Unless you're tearing down your father's altar to Bel, or TP in your youth pastor's house, God says, thou shalt not vandalize. <laughs> so in the morning, when the people of the town got up, there was Bell's altar, demolished, the Asherah pole beside it, cut down, and the second bull sacrificed on the newly built altar. They asked each other, who did this? When they carefully investigated, they were told Gideon, son of Joash, did it. 
The people of the town demanded of Joash, Bring out your son, he must die, because he has broken down Bell's altar and cut down the Asherah pole beside it. They've got their priorities um, screwed up there, and they're not mad that um, he has, uh, that he destroyed the bad altar, they're mad that he um, has built the good altar. The townspeople recognized Gideon's Yahweh rules graffiti, you know, building that good altar on there, and so they told his father, you know, bring Gideon out, we're going to kill him. And you thought the laws in your town were tough. Be glad you didn't grow up in ancient Israel. Evidently, the penalty for vandalism is pretty harsh. <laughs> and, uh, verses 31 and 32. Uh, but Joash replied to the hostile crowd around him, Are you going to plead Bell's cause? Are you trying to save him? Whoever fights for him shall be put to death by morning. If Bell really is a god, he can defend himself. When someone breaks down his altar. So that day they gave Gideon the name Jeroboam, saying, Let Baal contend with him because he broke down Baal's altar. So this has earned Gideon a nickname, Jeroboam, which means he contend with them, um, or let him let Baal contend with him. I bet his friends just kept with calling him Gideon or G-Dog or something like that. When we talked about the golden calf, I mentioned a Syrian storm, storm god named Hadad because he was usually depicted as standing on the back of a bull. The Hebrew word that's transliterated bell is really just a generic term that means Lord. And the difference between a translation and a transliteration is a transliteration is you actually take how the word sounds in that other language and you try to make it sound the same in the language that uh, the person you're writing it for speaks. So um, Hebrew has different letters than we do, so they've used our English letters, and they've written it out exactly like it sounds rather than trying to find a word. Translation would be finding what English word means the same thing. And so sometimes when we have that word bell, they actually translate it to what it means today, Lord. So sometimes when you see the word Lord in the Bible, it's the same Hebrew word that they transliterate, just do the sounding of bell. And it depends on the context. Um, sometimes it's used of humans, and of course there it's not talking about, you know, uh, God. It's talking about, you know, like the difference between a servant and a master. They might call their master Lord. Um, it's even used of our God. I mean, we call God Lord, they call God Lord. Um, but when it was specifically used of a false God, it was usually talking about a specific God. And the Bible just always referred to him by this word, Baal. And it's probably what most of the people refer to him to. They didn't use his name very often. And um, the god that it was referring to in the Bible was probably referring to was this god, Hadad, which was a storm god. And also the bell cycle that we have depicts bell as a storm god. So it seems to match up that Hadad and bell were the same. So that's probably who we're talking about. On the handout there, I've got a picture. And this was actually, we've been talking about Ugarit. It's very important to our understanding of this, because a lot of this we only have the Bible if we didn't have. And this was discovered in Ugarit, and this is what they thought Bell looked like. And he had a helmet on that had horns on the helmet. And in one hand, he was holding a club, and in the other hand, he was holding a weapon or something that looked like a spear. Since he's a storm god, people think that's probably supposed to be like a lightning bolt. And sometimes, you know, you see like Zeus holding a lightning bolt. Same thing here, they've given him a lightning bolt as his weapon since he's a storm god. Another deity is mentioned in the showdown and appears next to Bel. We even saw it in the story in Gideon. Most of the times that Bel is mentioned in the Bible, and that's the goddess Asherah. When she's mentioned in the Bible, it's usually referring to some kind of object that was used to worship her. Uh, it was probably, the Bible's not completely clear on it, but it was probably either a wood pole or some kind of special tree. And what the Bible refers to as Asherah is probably the same as Atherot in the Bell Cycle, who was Bell's mother, and who convinced El to have the palace built for Bell. Now, before we can dive into the showdown that we're looking at today, we need to jump back a couple chapters in 1 Kings the beginning of Ahab's reign as king of the northern kingdom of Israel. And if you remember back to when we talked about the golden calf, Jeroboam was the first king, after they split into these two um, kingdoms, of this northern kingdom. 
and he decided to put two golden calves that they could worship instead of going back down to the south kingdom where the temple was and worshiping God. Well, the northern kingdom has kept following that path of worshiping other gods instead of the true God, and Ahab, it says, to him, it was just a trivial matter, what, Joab, um, what Jeroboam had done. He even marries a woman from one of the peoples around him. It wasn't an Israelite woman. Her name was Jezebel. And you've probably all heard about Jezebel. She did some very wicked things. And one of the things that she did is she brought the God that she worshipped, and Ahab said, just bring him on. And he even built there in the northern kingdom a temple to Bel, because that was the God that she worshipped, and put an altar to Bel in there. He decided, you know, that's what we here in Israel are going to worship now, is Bel, you know, my wife's God. And it says in the Bible that he did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than all the kings of Israel before him. So he was a very wicked king, and he led them astray. And still before we get to the showdown itself, we have what would be like a pre-game or a pre-match. In chapter 17 of 1 Kings, the prophet Elijah announces that there's going to be a drought, that God's going to keep it from raining. Now, Bel is the storm god. He's the one who's supposed to be in charge of whether it rains or not. But here we see that he's powerless to make it rain when God has stopped it from raining. And then our story that we're looking at starts in chapter 18 of Kings. And 1 Kings 18.16 says that Ahab went to meet Elijah. When he saw Elijah, he said to him, is that you, you troubler of Israel? I have not made trouble for Israel, Elijah replied, but you and your father's family have. You have abandoned the Lord's commands and have followed the bells. Now summon the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel and bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. Did you catch that? Elijah asked for the people from all all over Israel to come to Mount Sinai. He's saying, you know, put it on the radio, take out a TV commercial, take out a full-page ad in the Sunday newspaper. He wants everyone to know about this. He means business. He wants everyone to see who the true God is. And the story goes on. So Ahab sent word throughout all Israel and assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel. Elijah went before the people and said, How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Bel is God, follow him. But the people said nothing. Then Elijah said to them, I am the only one of the Lord's prophets left, but Bel has 450 prophets. Get two bulls for us. Let Bel's prophet choose one for themselves, and let them cut it into pieces, and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. I will prepare the other bull, and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. Then you call on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of the Lord. The God who answers by fire, he is God. Then all the people said, what you say is good. So um, Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one of the bulls and prepare it first. Since there are so many of you, call on the name of your God, but do not light the fire. So they took the bull given them and prepared it. Then they called in the name of Bel from morning till noon. Bel, answer us! They shouted, but there was no response. No one answered. And they danced around the altar they had made. At noon, Elijah began to taunt them. Shout louder, he said. But there was no response. Uh, he said, surely he is a god. Perhaps he is deep in thought or busy or traveling. Maybe he is sleeping and must be awakened. A true god wouldn't need to sleep. Some versions even say that, you know, he taunts me, you know, maybe he's relieving himself. A true God wouldn't need to go to the bathroom. So, you know, Elijah's, you know, taunting them here. And in 28 and 29, you know, they do what he said to you. So they shout louder. They even cut themselves. They slash themselves with swords and spears as their custom until their blood flowed. Midday passed, and they continued their frantic prophesying until the time for the evening sacrifice. But there was no response. No one answered. No one paid attention. Then it's Elijah's turn. He has to repair the altar of God first. It wasn't even in repair. Um, the other altar was all ready and everything, um, but they had let God's altar go into disrepair. So he gets it repaired, and he's ready to start. But then he asks for four large jars to be filled with water and dump it on top of it. 
And he says, do it again. And he says, do it again a third time. So it's covered in water. And we pick it up in verse 36. At the time of sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel, and that I am your servant, and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, Lord, answer me, so these people will know that you, Lord, are God, and that you are turning their hearts back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell, and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, and the stones, and the soil, and also looked up the water in the trench. When all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. As a storm god, Bel should have been able to send lightning. That lightning bolt he's holding, he should have been able to throw that down and start fire. Bel wasn't able to prevent God from withholding rain from Israel, nor was he able to send lightning. He's not looking like such a great storm god right now, is he? Elijah then ordered all the prophets of Bel be killed. And he also told Ahab that God was, sin was ending the drought, and then it rained. It was common in the ancient Near East for one group of people to adopt their gods from another group of people. The Israelites saw the other people do it. The Philistines, we said, they may have got their god Dagon from one of the other peoples once they got there and said, Oh, we like that god and take it. And so the peoples in this area would pick and choose gods. They would take a god from this group of people and a god from this group of people and would make it their own. You're probably thinking, that may have happened back then, but that doesn't happen today. But people still pick and choose what um, choose their gods today. Rather than believing in what the Bible says, people go window shopping for gods. And they look for gods who fit what they already believe. When celebrities endorse endorse obscure religions like Scientology and Kabbalah, they are window shopping for what they think fits them best. Looking for religion that fits you best is going about things backward. We don't choose God. God chooses us. You'll see there in the handout, I've got a space for that. Yeah, that's doing it backwards. We don't choose God. God chooses us. God chose the people of Israel. They didn't choose him. When they did choose their own God, they ended up with a calf or a storm god that couldn't even make storms. There's a conference called TED that's held in California once a year. And it started in the 80s as a technology conference, but it's got a lot more um, broad since then. And what they do is they pick leaders in their field of study. And they pick some of the most brilliant communicators in the world to come to this conference once a year. And the catch is they give them only 18 minutes. Every speaker there, no matter what their field is, has only 18 minutes to deliver a talk on what they're an expert at. And this causes them to really narrow it down to just the essence of what they do and what they study and they're an expert at. They have to get rid of anything, you know, that's not really that important and really just um, hammer it down. And it costs thousands of dollars to actually attend this conference. It's become very popular, but they put all of these talks on the Internet for free. There's even an app for um, smartphones you can get for free and watch these talks. And actually, um, yesterday, after I gave chapel, I was looking for something to do while I was waiting around, I watched one of the talks that they invited Billy Graham in 1998 to come and speak. And he was speaking on a topic that was um, technology and religion. And he talked about how technology had improved life. Even in 98, Billy Graham was old. He's older now, but he talked in the video that he was turning 80 in just a few months. So he said, of course I'm glad for technology. You know, he says, there's all kinds of things they can do for my health at 80 now that they couldn't have done earlier. And he makes things more comfortable. But he also said in the video, there is something inside of us that's beyond our understanding. That's the part of us that yearns for God or something more than we find in technology. So there's something inside of us that yearns for something more that technology is never going to be able to improve, is never going to be able to make better. And that's because we are made the want God. You probably heard you know that we each have a God-shaped hole inside of us. And God has created us to worship. And you'll see there in your handout, um, everyone worships something. Even if they don't realize it, everyone is worshiping something. Whether it's their own reason, or science, or nature. I'm always interested in hearing all viewpoints. I want to learn as much as I can, 
so that I can effectively share Christ with different people. So when um, atheist Richard Dawkins was speaking at OU, my best friend and I went to listen to him. And what I was struck with is what it seemed like he was doing at this conference, and he's an atheist, was evangelism. It just wasn't evangelism for Jesus. It was evangelism for atheism. And um, everyone believes in something, and he believed in his own reason that he had it figured out, but everyone believes in something, whether they believe it or not, you know, whether they realize it or not. God made you to worship him. You can chase all kinds of other beliefs, faiths, philosophies, and religions, trying to find what fits you best. But they're all false gods. You won't be truly happy until you are worshiping the creator who chose you.